World War II is going to be a motorized conflict on land, at sea, and in the air. And that will require massive amounts of oil. So I guess you could argue that in 1920, as Britain takes control of the Middle Eastern oil fields, the war is already decided. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. World War I saw the end of four great empires, but it was neither the end of the age of empires nor the end of imperial colonialism. However, this year, 1920, is right at the beginning of that end. Now, all over the world, colonial subjects rise up against their colonial masters, and those dissolved empires make way for new nations. The surviving imperial colonial power that faces the greatest challenge is probably Great Britain. While Britain is building new zones of influence within what was the Ottoman Empire, there's unrest in Egypt, India, and Ireland. Essentially, it's the same root issue in all those places, equal rights and self-determination. Thing is, instead of acknowledging the equal rights of colonial subjects, the British have been quenching them. This has now led to outright demands for independence. And that's a real problem now in 1920, because, you see, Britain granting the colonies independence would mean financial disaster. Here's why. According to a University of Birmingham study from 2009, Britain was increasing its financial dependency on the empire dramatically in the early 1920s, and thereby cannibalizing its own economy. This was part of a change in the flow of imports and exports brought about by the World War. To put it in a vastly oversimplified way, Britain is facing decreasing export opportunities and are now compensating by pushing exports to their colonies. Before the war, it had largely been the reverse. Britain had been importing cheaply from the colonies at the expense of the colonial populations. The reversal of that flow worsens the problems for the colonial territories, though. Now they're being forced to buy expensively from Britain, while Britain is buying less from them. It's pretty easy to see that this system is not sustainable, and the empire is now caught in a deadly financial downward spiral. While an economic boom with increasing trade volumes takes off in many parts of the world, Great Britain faces a continuous decline of trade volume, with an aggregate 33% decrease between 1920 and 1928. But if it's so obvious, then why did they do it? Well, they didn't do it. It was simply the effect of the dynamics of changing trade and how the imperial British trade system was set up. In other words, they only see the effect. And even if they do see the cause, there's little they can do about it in the short term, except one thing, hold on to their colonies. That, on the other hand, is pretty short-sighted as it only perpetuates the problem. But nevertheless, they will sure as hell try. Beyond the economic issues, there's effects brought about by the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire and stripping Germany of its colonies. Add to this the awakening of a sense of independence that's sweeping the world, and you have all the components for a perfect storm. And that storm is brewing in the Middle East, with the additional spice of valuable oil resources at stake. The dissolution of the Ottoman Empire was decided in Paris last year, and the details were hashed out at the Treaty of Sèvres. Although the treaty will finally be signed on August 10th this year, the Allied powers are already starting to implement it. It stipulates that all non-Turkish Ottoman territory shall be ceded to the Allies. This means that the provinces of Syria and Mesopotamia will be carved away from Turkey. Turkey itself will eventually be allowed independence, but will largely stay occupied by the Allies for the time being. A part of southwestern Turkey and the area in Europe west of Constantinople are to go to Greece. By the way, that Syria of 1920 is what we know today as Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Palestine, and parts of modern Syria. That Mesopotamia is today's Iraq, Kuwait, parts of modern Syria, and parts of Saudi Arabia. Now, if you think that the ethnic map of Europe caused problems when the lands were divided into nation states. This is even worse. Many of the tribes living here are still nomadic. The stationary population is a mixture of various Arab tribes, Shia Muslims, Sunni Muslims, a dozen or so Christian denominations, Jews, and God knows what else. Oh, hey, you get it? 
Okay, the language groups are just as diverse with speakers of a variety of Arab dialects, Kurdish, Hebrew, Armenian, Turkish, Persian, and well, many other smaller languages. And these ethnicities are not clearly separated geographically. But in 1920, there is hope. During the Great War, many of the tribes have come together to fight the Ottomans aided by the British. They have been united by a joint effort between T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, and Emir Faisal, the eldest son of the Sharif of Mecca, head of the Hashemite family. Now, in 1920, the tribes are still ready to work with Faisal to create a united Arabia, also called Greater Syria, that would avoid the problems of ethnic separation. But they need the allies to approve it. And remember how the British promised Faisal exactly this at the Paris Peace Conference? Well, when push comes to shove and oil is at stake, it turns out to be an empty promise. While Britain is ready to compromise, the French are insisting on holding on to their power in the region, blocking the possibility of independence. Any hopes that Faisal might have had to get help from the British were dashed at the end of 1919, when the British and French signed an agreement resulting in the withdrawal of British troops. Now, in January 1920, Faisal is negotiating only with the French. The French offer him a compromise where the Arabs get independence as long as France gets a monopoly on supplying Faisal's government with technical counseling and advisory issues. In essence, this puts France in a position to have full oversight and control of the oil trade. Faisal does accept this, but faced with a huge backlash from his more radical, anti-French, Arab nationalist supporters, he rescinds the agreement soon after. There is unrest across the territory, and repeated attacks against French institutions escalate into armed conflict. The Syrian Congress is convened in March and unilaterally declares Greater Syria with Faisal as king and his brother Abdullah as regent of Mesopotamia. The British and French call together the San Remo Conference in response. Between April 19th and 26th, the prime ministers of Britain France and Italy and representatives from Japan, Belgium and Greece meet to decide the partitioning of the Arab world. Note, Faisal's government is not invited. Great Britain and France are given mandates over Syria and Mesopotamia and Faisal's greater Syria is not recognized. Britain gets the better oil fields, but to balance the deal, Britain grants France a 25% share of any oil coming from the Mosul region. Faisal refuses to accept the results from San Remo, but in July, he's defeated by the French and goes into exile in Great Britain. Now, Faisal is a really diplomatic and pragmatic guy, right? Despite the betrayal by the British, he's still willing to continue working with them. In Faisal, they see a potential ruler that will respect British alliances for the parts of their Mesopotamian mandate that will soon become Iraq. The British believe that he will be a pliant partner, as he's not at all from the region. He's a Sunni Muslim minority member, while Iraq is mostly Shia, and no one knows him there. So he has no power base and will depend on their support. Lawrence, uh, the writer and Middle East expert Gertrude Bell, and a number of British officials start a campaign to win support among the Iraqi tribes. They succeed, and Faisal is made the first king of Iraq in 1921, following a plebiscite showing 96% support. It should be noted that though there were three candidates to choose from originally, but the British wanted Faisal, one was disqualified for being too old, and the other was mysteriously arrested and shipped off to Sri Lanka. Lawrence and Bell do the same trick in Jordan, installing Faisal's brother Abdullah on the throne there. Now, this might sound great, but it really isn't. The borders that have now been drawn in this region are completely arbitrary, opening up the potential for ethnic conflict simply by division. The faisal Wiseman agreement that promised a Jewish state in Palestine is effectively dead now that Faisal cannot rally the needed support from all the other Arab tribal leaders. But at least Great Britain and France have secured the oil. Hmm? Two decades from now, a man that on October 20th of this year, 1920, is promoted to company commander in the 13th Infantry Regiment in Stuttgart, will desperately try to take that control away from the British by force. He is Erwin Rommel, and as Rommel would tell you, to take the oil in the Middle East, you need to take Egypt and the Suez Canal first. Early on in the World War, Egypt had cut all ties to the Ottomans and was declared a sultanate under a British protectorate. The Egyptians 
expect this to be a temporary wartime measure that would eventually lead to self-determination. But now, in the post-war circumstances, Egypt is strategically important for Britain to prop up its failing trade system. First of all, the privately owned and operated Suez Canal cuts right through Egypt. This is the most important trade route between Europe and South and Southeast Asia, absolutely vital to Britain's colonial trade system. Second of all, remember what Rommel would one day say. But the Egyptians don't want any part of this. They want their independence. The justice minister in the British-controlled Khadiv government, Saad Jaglou, leader of the Waft Party, faces an unwilling negotiating partner that won't even let him go to Paris to the peace conference. But Zaglul is a man of decisive action. He's also an Egyptian peasant son who has managed to get through law school and forge a successful career in law and politics based on his personal drive. In early 1919, he starts organizing a popular movement to increase pressure on the British so they will allow Egyptian representation in Paris. But instead of inviting Zaglul to Paris, on March 8th, the British arrest him and his Waft Party associates and exile them to Malta. The following day, Egyptians all over the country rise up in protest. All of the major cities explode in strikes, protests, and civil disobedience. In a few places, there are violent attacks on British institutions and resources. The British respond with a brutal crackdown. At least 800 Egyptians are killed. The Egyptians do not respond with more violence, though. Instead, they take an unexpected way forward. It's the wives, mothers, and daughters of the exiled Waft Party leaders and of other politicians that take control of the protest movement. Huda Sharawi, the independent-minded and well-educated daughter of Muhammad Sultan, the first president of the Egyptian Representative Council, is the driving force. A week after the initial protests, on March 16th, Sharawi leads hundreds of women in a protest march through Cairo. During the earlier protests, a few women had been badly beaten and abused by the police, which had caused outrage even among the authorities themselves. Now the Egyptian police and the British forces are under strict orders to only block the march, but under no circumstances use violence. They have, however, been permitted to verbally insult the women. Faced with roadblocks, manned with machine guns, the women cannot advance, but they stand their ground. For three hours, they stand still in the blazing sun, ululating at the police and chanting, long live freedom and liberty. And any verbal abuse from the police is drowned out by a unified chorus of angry Egyptian women. More women's marches follow, and the movement spreads beyond the political and financial elite. Soon, thousands and thousands of women from all walks of life are marching against the British. Muslims, Jews, Cops and other Christians, rich and poor, wives, mothers and daughters, slip discreetly through the streets, circumventing the cordons only to reassemble behind the blockades. Arm in arm, they march to the next blockade and again stand still, ululating and chanting their demands for independence. This game of civil disobedience continues through the spring without any major violent incidents, but it's paralyzing the country. British General Edmund Allenby, the wartime conqueror of Palestine and now High Commissioner of Egypt, faces either another brutal crackdown or a compromise. He chooses the latter and releases Jaglul and the rest of the Waft Party officials. He promises negotiations and the protests die down for now. In early autumn of 1919, Allenby asks the Colonial Secretary Lord Milner to assemble a committee and come to Egypt to seek a solution. Milner wants to break up the Egyptian political front and find loyal British supporters from within and without the Waft Party. But Zaglul sees through Milner's plan. The Egyptians close ranks and refuse to talk to Milner and his commission, always referring them back to Zaglul. In the end, Milner leaves Egypt without a solution and the protests resume. The British don't have any choice now but to talk directly to Zaglul and in the summer of 1920, they meet in London for negotiations. The British are willing to change the terms of the protectorate into an alliance, but insist on full control of the Suez Canal region. Unofficially, they even promise Zaglo real independence, but he doesn't trust the British and refuses. He returns to Egypt empty-handed, and again, the protests resume. This back and forth will go on for two years until Zaglo is arrested and deported again, this time to the Seychelles. The paralysis of the country is by then taking a toll on everyone and some of Zoglu's supporters cave in. They form a new party, the Liberal Constitutionalists, and accept the British terms. But 
Zagwell's staunch resistance, the women's marches, and the united front of both genders from all walks of life and all ethnicities has sown a seed in Egyptian culture that will eventually lead to the Egyptian Revolution of 1952. 1920 is far in the future though, and for now, the British have at least retained control of Suez, which will be of great, perhaps even decisive significance during World War II as Rommel goes for the oil fields further east. 1920, a year in the Middle East where the local population showed that they were responsible, educated modern peoples while their colonial masters continued the ancient feudal game of geopolitical chess. A year that laid down one of the cornerstones that will secure victory in World War II for the future allies, but also laid the foundation for ethnic, geopolitical, and global financial conflicts that are still burning dangerously hot almost a hundred years later. In our next episode, we'll take a look at how women and the youth in the West are dealing with this new world when we talk about sex, drugs, and the right to vote. To get our episodes ahead of time and to support the effort to make more content like this, join the Time Ghost Army on Patreon or directly on our timeghost.tv website. There you can also sign up for our forum for free. And if you have not already, subscribe to Time Ghost and World War II on YouTube. World War II, week by week, starts September 1st, 2018. And if you missed the episode of Between Two Wars about the Paris Peace Conference, it is right here. See you next time. And as the Arab proverb goes, avoid the company of liars. But if you can't, don't believe them.